Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us at this 2021 OCA Virtual Summit. Right now, our session is Funding Our Chapter Success, which is co-hosted with the Japanese American Citizens League, JACL. This portion of the panel has been pre-recorded, but please note that we will have a live Q&A session shortly after each presenter. First up, we have Peggy Du, Interim Executive Director of the Association of Chinese Americans, ACA, also known as the OCA Detroit Chapter. Peggy, thank you for being here. Hi, Du. Uh, thank you for your introduction. And it's my pleasure to be um, one of the speaker for uh, founding our chapter success on um, workshop. So today um, I'm going to um, briefly um, talk about, um, about the grant application. So I'm starting to share my screen. Can you all see my screen? Yes, that looks great. Okay. So hi everyone. So um, I'm Peggy Du. I'm the interim executive director of Association of Chinese Americans. So I want to start um, first to um, introduce on um, our OCA Detroit chapter. So we are founded in 1972. So we do have um, four service centers across a metro Detroit area, cover uh, three counties. Um, so um, there are around like um, one. 150,000 um, Asian Pacific Americans residents um, in Metro Detroit. And through our service center, we reach directly to 10,000 people, um, the community members each year. So we do have our Chinese community center in Madison Heights, Michigan. It's our own property uh, in the area. So talking about grant. There's a lot of things to share, and I do enjoy like um, the grant development and funding different um, grant opportunities. So to be started, um, each year uh, our chapter has the annual plan uh, to um, look for the grant and program, which are like match our ACA and OCA missions. So uh, they are um, covered from um, different categories. For example, we have uh, prevention, uh, senior or youth or community related grants. So uh, next, I'm going to talk about um, manage grant applications. So even though there are no like uh, formulas uh, or right or wrong answers to um, do a grant application, there are some common application components. For example, on the 501c3 letter, on the chapter annual achievement report, the org chart, operation budget, an audited financial statement, and something about our board of directors. So uh, in the next session, uh, we are going to um, see uh, those um, components one more time. So each of them uh, uh, requires um, like by different um, funding agents. Sometimes uh, they're all required. Sometimes only part of them are required. So um, our uh, regular um, process of uh, writing grant. So how do we get started? Uh, when um, we are alert of uh, the new grant opportunity, one of our grantee member uh, will review the grant information to the best of the knowledge. And if it looks like a good fit for ACA, um, the uh, team member will send a summary to the team lead and with the basic information about the grant. Then the team lead will decide whether to proceed with the grant application. So typical grant writing process, what do we expect? The team lead uh, will review the grant opportunities and decide um, initially to proceed with the application. So after this step, usually um, the whole team member uh, will uh, get together and have a brainstorming session. So um, based on the RFP, it's a request for proposal. This is the most important part to understanding about the grant. So each team member, the participant, are expected to um, read through the RFP and come up with some um, thoughts and ideas to share with the group. Then um, the team leader will formally decide whether to proceed with this application and will assign the team members with different roles. Uh, example, like um, application drafts, um, budgeting, research and editing. And we will also set a timeline to completion of the draft 
and do a final application. So during the drafting and editing process, uh, a complete list of the questions required by the RFP uh, from the um, funding agency's application portal, we will uh, record the questions and list it in the Google Drive and to share with our team members. So from there, every team member can collaborate on answering the questions. And comes the last step, submission. So the team lead will do the last final approval and then the grant can be uploaded and submitted to the portal. So next part, I'm going to um, use um, two examples about um, to go through the grant application. So each grant um, is quite different. So this one, uh, I'm talking about a government grant. So it provides um, the funds to support tobacco prevention. So some information when we first um, get a request for proposal. So we will review um, what's the qualification, the eligibility for um, organization who can apply for this grant. And the deadline is very important. Don't ever miss a deadline. So we are not qualified. And we need to know um, the total grant available. Sometimes it will not tell us uh, like exact amount we can apply, but it will say the total grant available and the estimated numbers of awards. So we know sometimes it's very, very um, competitive and to be like uh, earned awards. And sometimes uh, you will have um, the question regarding match funding. So uh, it means that um, the agency will give us some sort of grant, but our chapter, we need to match our own money, either it's uh, cash or like some other um, in-kind donations. And we also need to know about the funding priorities to uh, make sure we understand what this uh, funding and program for and to, de um, to develop um, the directions for our application. And we need to pay attention to the unallowable expenses, those for the budget part. And very important is for um, understanding the program requirements and outcomes and like uh, how um, they measure the evaluation our success. And the last but not least, the reporting requirements. Reporting is uh, very, very important. Like uh, we have monthly, quarterly, and final report usually. So yeah, also want to pay attention to some special requirements. For example, uh, this one, not only um, as ACA, we provide some information about our own organization. It also requires a multiple sector partnership uh, from our community members. So it has to consisting of a minimum of four member organizations and representing two or more of the following. So we can see uh, they are looking for collaboration from local public health departments, community and faith-based organization, academic institution, community residents, healthcare institution, and local business. So it takes time when we need to find partners and to get their support letters. So this should be like a very first step if we decided to proceed with the grant. And then we need to find our partners and get the uh, support letter as soon as possible. So this grant also talking about the evaluation criteria. So it gave us an overview, like uh, when um, the grant, um, the evaluation team review our, our proposal, whether we are going to have a big chance to being selected. So um, they require uh, us to provide narrative regarding the organization experience, past performance. So this part can be um, achieved from our like uh, annual achievement report, which uh, has our um, service number, um, service scope, and um, past year event summaries, and the priority population. So this part um, requires research and statistics support um, from the public website um, to demonstrate um, the needs from our Asian community. The program implementation, that's very important. So they would like to see a detailed work plan. For example, it's a one-year program. How are we going to deliver um, our program and what's the outcomes? And another exam very important part is the staff confidential or credential, I'm sorry, and qualification. So um, this part, um, talking about um, our staff. So they want to know we're professional and we do have um, the certified or licensed staff to handle the project and to 
deliver the right message to the community members. And the next part is um, program evaluation. So this, um, like uh, we have on the peer rate, uh, like um, kind of quarterly and like uh, in the middle of um, the midpoint evaluation so that uh, we know if we are doing in a good way or if we need to have some strategy to um, keep improving on our um, action plan to achieve the final goals. And the next part is the budget narrative. So they not only want the number, like uh, how uh, much we want to ask for, they also care about like uh, how do we use the money in details. Uh, for example, they would like to know which um, program staff, how many hours are allocated to this program and what's on their uh, rate. And like uh, if we were to purchase some supplies and how we are going to use that. So every single details, um, including like um, some um, communications and um, internet bills. So they will also like to see the details. So that total 100 points. So like uh, anyone who get the highest points, like um, I think this one's uh, at least we need to get over um, 75 points to be reviewed. So here is some like details about the budget and reporting requirements. So uh, usually um, budget will allow the salary like for um, the project director and direct service staff and some like administration cost. And the fringe usually will put um, the FICA cost, which is 7.65% uh, of the salary. And some travel mileage reimbursement is allowed. And the rate, uh, we need to check the IRS website um, for the rates. Uh, usually um, the January 1st, they will have update rate. So the program expense, like I mentioned, can be covered office supplies and printing costs, postage and some communication costs. So the reporting requirements. So this one do require a monthly financial report um, because government fund is on a reimbursement based. So we need to provide uh, our actual cost to be reimbursed by monthly. And also quarterly, we will have the progress report. And uh, uh, this one, since uh, we have the partners uh, from different sectors and when we meet quarterly, uh, we need to provide um, the agenda and meeting minutes uh, for the input of the partnership meeting. So it's also a big um, good opportunity for us like to um, hear about the feedback and to um, provide the right direction to finish the project. Uh, so this um, pretty much covers this uh, governmental fund. So next part um, is um, another grant. It's a general foundation grant, um, giving us the uh, funding to uh, support caregiver resource. So uh, this one looks a little bit different. And also we get some important information from the RFP. So the first part, eligibility. So they emphasize like we need to be a nonprofit on um, local units of government and the state of Michigan are eligible for this grant. And uh, we have to be recognized by the IRS uh, Internal Revenue Service as a nonprofit organization. That's where we need to submit our 501c3 letter to show our status. And based on Michigan and has current certified financial audit, that's the um, uh, uh, 10, uh, I mean, the 990 form and the audited statement to show where our financial is good in a good standing. And we have to at least have one full time staff. They also um, provide like uh, helpful hints um, for us when we're working on, on the application. So they would like to know um, our project and the issue will be addressed. And they like to see the collaborations. And also uh, since this uh, caregiver um, health related grant, they would like to know the health outcomes and also the sustainability is more than the buzzword, right? So like um, grants um, usually um, it's not like a long term, it's been one year or two years sometimes. So like uh, what if, um, how do we continue if um, the grant does not like uh, support further years? And uh, the anticipated organizational improvement should be clear. So we're um, improving ourselves. So what they uh, like uh, want to see the improvements and outcomes. And for the grant amount, so this one specific, um, like uh, saying like uh, the grants, um, they have a big range from 100,000 to 500,000. And um, we can only apply for uh, like just uh, no larger than 20% of our annual operating budget. 
So like uh, that's where we need to um, present our organization uh, operating budget, the annual one. And like uh, it has requirement uh, re regarding the indirect and administration costs should not be uh, more than 10% of the total grant budget. So this one, the budget um, covers not only um, the salary, fringe, travel, program expense, uh, like the last one, the tobacco one, and also uh, it covers uh, consultant fees uh, and some indirect costs like um, insurance, and it covers equipment. Um, it's not very common. Um, some grants does not cover the equipment, but this one do, does cover. So we need to pay attention to what is allowable, what is not allowable expenses. And this is uh, like a, a corporation funding. So uh, we do not need to submit um, the monthly financial report. Instead, we will do a final financial report and we still have a quarterly meeting um, with the funding um, agency to do a report for our quarterly. And the final program report is at the end of the grant period. We will um, meet um, with um, the funding agency and to submit our financial and program report showing about our, um, our achievements and challenges. Yeah, so thank you for your time. Uh, that ends my um, presentation. Let me know like, if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Peggy. That was really great. Um, I mean, I know I definitely have a few questions just to clarify for like the audience and even myself, but um, my first question is, so how do you initially come across these two grants? Like I know you mentioned that part of, you have like an annual planning. So do you just Google search or um, re re recommendation? Yeah, how do you find them? Yeah, too, that's a very good question. So like uh, we want to make sure the grant is reliable. So like uh, we just don't do Google search because if we don't know the funding agencies, it's going to be, uh, uh, we need to be cautious about that. Mm -hmm. So the first one, the tobacco grant is actually from Michigan State and MDHHS, Department of um, Health and Human Services. So we do um, create an account with MDHHS. So whenever uh, there is a new grant opportunity, so they will send us notifications. And also we can go log into the website to search for the uh, new grant openings that is suitable for ACA. So that's the reason why we come across the first one. And the second one uh, is a uh, like connection for our board members. So when she see this website and she sees a good fit um, for ACA's mission and they uh, happen to have a grant opening. So we start to um, search for the website. And actually we first um, noticed an organization since December of 2016 but we didn't get our first approval grant until 2019. So it took our quite a long way to um, finally to get to that. So uh, we do have um, many different channels to uh, look for new grant opportunities. Oh, wow. So just to follow up on that second grant, you are you saying you applied like every year until 2019, you were finally approved? Uh, so each year they do have on um, the grant openings like uh, different mm. um, directions they're looking for like mm. um, healthy living or other capacity building mm -hmm. so the first time we tried is like a very limited available so that's the reason why we need to start early to plan for such big grants so that's a lot of work on um, research and we have to like um, let uh, our funding agency know why ACA is a good fit for this grant so like a uh, um so the first year we did not get it and the second year I, I i don't think we get a lot but the third time we try we got that finally mm. and so when you are um you have your annual planning to for to apply to grants and foundations um and i saw you had buckets of work right you know um direct health services community work um etc so does that mean you um you are applying to get funding for work that you've already done or does your team kind of already have these like um, visions, these projects that you hope to fund and then you, um, when you come across the right grant, like you, um, does, does that make sense? Yeah.
Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, so that's uh, actually another very good question. So there are like uh, maybe like uh, hundreds or even thousands of uh, grant opportunities. But um, I think each year we apply, um, I think around 10 to 20. So it's um, based on our community needs. So there are some grants we might start it um, with no grant support, with our self-sustaining uh, program income. But then we see a chance to have funding support. We will definitely go ahead and apply. But some like um, we we do not have uh, like a service or program like uh, existing, but we do see that's a community needs. For example, small business one or something mm -hmm. financial development. So we will set this as our goal. So we'll keep looking for new fundings to help uh, with capacity building and training. So kind of generally to start up the, the new program, but it's all like uh, everything based on our mission and goals. So that's, uh, we have the annual planning for the program and grants. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's that's really good to know. Um, so I actually had this question down and you mentioned it is like, how big of a role does your board because, um, I mean, Peggy went over this earlier, but for those of you who don't realize by now, ACA um, has paid staff. So they have a building, they have paid staff. So Peggy, you are the interim ED and you also have like a board, um, just like how OCA National um, has our executive council along with, you know, national headquarters staff like myself and Lady. So how, what kind of role does your board play? You said one of them made a recommendation. Do they, are they part of this grant team by any chance? Yeah, sometimes on um, the big grants, we definitely need to um, have the board on um, idea and involvement give us the big directions. And our board member plays a really important um, role in the grant application and like search grant opportunity. And they're super helpful. So like, for example, like a board members connect us with an OCA national. So even for the past month, I think there are a um, couple of our grants opportunities we know from OCA, like um, the ATNT access and the Wells Fargo sub grant and also um, the one we're now working on is the Gold Futures Challenge. So board members are um, connecting us with the new grant opportunities from national side. And also on um, our board members, um, like um, they do have um, connections through their uh, professional uh, work field. Uh, for example, um, like our treasurer, she's a CPA. So like uh, um, she connect us with them, um, give us uh, the message of the PPP loan from SBA last year. And we do have another board member, like she's uh, like a financial consultant and uh, specialist. So also like um, another, um, connection channel is um, the nomination fund. So um, our board can nominate ACA um, to apply for like uh, the community funds or through their company network. So it all gave us like a lot of um, opportunities to um, get connected to um, the local organizations and as well as like um, our existing funding agencies, they might have um, the network and to share the new grant opportunities in the existing area, especially for um, the governmental health and like for the education one for the ES0 and uh, anywhere. So like we'll keep looking for uh, those grant opportunities, which I'm super for ACA the most. Mm, yeah, that's a really good point. And I want to really play up the fact that like, it's not always just on like the executive director and the development staff, it really takes the involvement of the board. Um, and that's, you know, one of their key roles is helping you fundraise. Um, so, you know, a lot, not all of our chapters, OCA chapters and JACL out there, I, I know not everybody has paid staff. Um, how big, so we want to get an idea of, you know, how big is your grant team? <laughs> how many development staff do you have? Uh, so, like, um, well, like, uh, I think um, the team, like, uh, so we have on um, this um, um, specialist, like, come and go, and, like, uh, some are our, um, like, um, program staff who has on um, the public health background. And some are like uh, uh, staff with an advocacy background. Like even though our interns, our summer interns, like uh, who are major in business development, civic engagement, and like um, um, public health. So we all want um, them because like uh, when we're doing the brainstorming, like um, more uh, ideas are welcome. So that even like the new staff, um, the younger generation who join us may give us some uh, fresh ideas. So like uh, our grand team, so the core team like uh, is like, um, I've said I'm included. So I'm the team lead 
and we do have um, staff from different areas. So when we sit down together, so we could like um, have a, like a very um, productive um, discussion so that um, we come up with the idea and then we go with the um, application, answer the questions doing that. Mm, so you really involve kind of a little bit of like all of your team, all of the departments really so that there's like buy-in for when you do get a grant and you're, you have to execute the program. Um, yeah, I really, I really like that. Um, you mentioned earlier, I had a question about match funding. So some, some of the grants out there require, you know, um, we'll only grant you 500,000 if you're able to fundraise 500,000, something like that. That's a really big number, but um, how difficult has it been for your chapter like on a scale of like, I guess all of the different kinds of grants out there is match funding to you. Um, does it, is it more difficult? Like, is it easy to fundraise the matching grants? Um, like, do you prefer match funding grants? Yeah, so when it comes uh, with a matching funding grant, it's a little bit more challenge um, because it requires some actual work. But some, um, I would say like uh, most of them we have been on C is like a, allows the in-kind donation. So that we have to thankful for our like uh, donors and volunteers who contributed like, um, we have um, over 200 volunteers each year, like uh, um, help us um, with um, all aspects of our operations. So those um, in-kind donations will be kind of the match to meet the requirement. But when it comes with the cash um, match requirements, then we really have to like be very careful like how we can meet the requirements. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and then another part of um, your application process you mentioned is your annual report. Um, I think not enough people talk about the annual report and sometimes um, smaller chapters, um, when they're putting together the materials for either a grant application or meeting a funder, um, they're not sure what to include you know, in an annual report or sponsorship packet. So how detailed is your annual report? Um, how often, I guess it's annual, you off, you yeah. work on it once a year, but um, mm -hmm. you know, like how often are you updating information and things like that? Yeah, so our annual report um, has uh, some different parts. So uh, one part is our service numbers. So we provide social service to Metro Detroit area. So our uh, program specialist, our social worker, we have um, the service log. So at the end of um, the year, we put numbers from that service log, but we do have like a daily log. So that's from that part. And we do have event summaries. So each, part, each time we have an event, we will do a quick recap of um, what happened in the event and like how many participants and what's the impact so that uh, we do it like a regularly base. So at the end, we can just put that part in our um, like uh, annual report. And uh, um, additionally, so we will talk about updating our um, service center, um, all the services we provided, all the activities. And so those important information all together comes together as in our annual achievement report. Awesome. And is that, do you mail that out to everybody? Do you just have it on your website? Yeah, it's on our website. So mm -hmm. um, before the pandemic, uh, we print out some um, copies and to share mm -hmm. uh, with our um, community members, stakeholders um, during our annual gala, which is in October. Um, but during the pandemic, we don't have the hard copy, but we still have um, like electric copy posted on our website. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. And this is actually really important. I think we'll, we can uh, maybe wrap up with this question is you mentioned um, doing event reports, like after every event and also logging service hours. Um, do you, does ACA have a kind of standardized, like a formula of what kind of data you're collecting um, all the time? Or, in, or do you just, you know, does it depend on the foundation? Like when you are collecting event information, even, you know, when you're putting up a registration form for an event, is there like a standardized data, what kind of data you're collecting? Yes, we do. So uh, this year, just the um, past March, uh, ACA uh, is getting the COA accreditation as a council on accreditation. So uh, it's a, like a recognition of our service standard. And it's also a high higher requirement for our like uh, documentation. So we do have um, like a, a, a uniform, like a Google form for which information is required uh, to be collected. So that's uniform. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, 
Um, maybe just before we go to La Q&A and to um, Jinky's presentation on BAC, what would you say, you know, um, what would you say is the most important thing to keep in mind when um, you are writing a grant application, like when you're filling out these answers and together, what's the number one thing that you always should be keeping in mind? Uh, just to, before getting started, read through the RFP maybe 10 times. <laughs> okay, yeah. Because that really contains a lot of information, which is the most important part. If that we get the information wrong, like our foundation is not right, so couldn't mm -hmm. get um, like, like the good results like at the mm -hmm. end. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Peggy. So I think we'll move on to um, any live Q and A. So we'll switch to that, um, but stay tuned, and we'll we'll head to the next section of our, our presentation. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you too. Council's mission is to increase interest for OCA's objectives within the business community while giving business community valuable insight into the needs of the Asian American Pacific Islander community. The BAC is modeled on the OCA Nationals BAC, which OCA founder Kung Lee Wang formed in 1980 as an expansion of his mission that OCA mission could be furthered, advanced by creating strong and lasting partnership with America's corporate sector. We then adapted the BAC model to meet our local community needs. To be a member of the BAC, you need to represent a business nonprofit or an association that represents business interests and community outreach. There is no restriction on the number of businesses or organization that can join the BAC. While the original concept focused on businesses in the traditional sense, we have expanded BAC membership to include nonprofits, foundations, as well as partnership with the city and county governmental organizations. This expansion adds diversity to the BAC and also provides us the opportunity to qualify for additional funding streams. Ultimately, a BAC partner can be any group or entity that provides funding for an OCA community event, program, or activity. This funding could be a contribution from the entity or entering into the partnership for a project grant. For an example, partnering with a nonprofit that has a service center capabilities for a joint project allow the project to qualify for a grant that OCA Sacramento could not have an access to. It will took the project independently. A great sample of a government and a nonprofit collaboration is a recent partnership with the city of Sacramento for COVID-19 relief program that allowed us to distribute $500 to 10 low-income individuals. We believe in the power of collaboration. This work cannot be done alone. BAC participation translates to ongoing collaboration with OCA. The only all-inclusive AAPI grassroots organization. Networking opportunities with business and professionals in our community here in Sacramento. Recommendations and referrals 
for vacancies and help improving diversities in the workplace. One great example is we have had BAC member seeking qualified candidates for leadership and management vacancies. Our chapter has recommended candidates and served as a reference check for prospective applicants. OCA also serves as a leadership development and mentorship hub that OCA members can utilize to develop their next generation of leaders. We even have few current and past board of directors who learn about OCA Sacramento through their employer. One of the biggest benefits is to help connect businesses with opportunities to achieve their charitable giving and activity goals and give back to their local communities. A BAC member commented, OCA does a wonderful job of connecting with our community. We have many entities asking us to provide input on future community projects and events. We can provide support with outreach and messaging through our network via newsletter, social media, and of course, word of mouth. Amplifying a BAC member's press events and messages. One of our BAC member is a local bank. We collaborated to provide e-language support to small businesses applying for the Paycheck Protection Program. This collaboration deepened the outreach of the bank and we were able to help support small local businesses facing economic hardship due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our BAC partners know we do great work serving the community. We have maintained a fantastic long-term partnership over the past 14 years. Here are a few BAC projects we have done. Advocacy issue like our forum on anti-Asian hate and rapid response training. Food distribution programs to address food insecurity in the AAPI community. Some programs are geared toward developing the current and future workforce and cultivating a diverse pool of qualified leaders and talented individuals, like our first generation, Speak and Lead, and Women Initiative Programs. Events for seniors, like Scam Alert, Digital Literacy, or another BAC-driven project. As you can see, we have a variety of projects and programs that we lead or co-host on for our BAC members. It really depends upon their goals and priorities. One example to celebrate AAPI Heritage Month, one BAC member asked how they could help. They donated $15,000 to fund our food distribution event to low-income community members. Another example is to search in anti-Asian hate incidents nationwide. It attracted attention from our BAC members. Many reach out to inquire about what projects we had to attract or address anti-Asian hate and find out how they could contribute or demonstrate their support for the AAPI community. 
This support was one of the reasons our actions, not statesmen, virtual rally was so successful. We've also had partners interested in funding projects such as providing rapid response training to community members, including college students. If you are starting or growing BAC, you will want to get familiar with the topics and issues your BAC members are most interested in. Our BAC convenes for two networking events a year during our Dragon Boat Festival, springtime, and our reception to capital, fall time. BAC member exchange ideas pertaining to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and AAPI community issues. Additionally, we schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings with each BAC member a minimum of twice a year to better understand their unique needs and perspectives around the AAPI community and to exchange ideas. We have a great relationship with lots of informal and impromptu communication with our BAC members. BAC members will contact us if there are programs and projects that they would like us to implement via partnership with a grassroots organization. How often you meet will depend on the individual makeup of UBAC. The format and frequency of communication and meeting will have to be adjusted depending on your BAC members, their preference and their availability. You will may want to adjust, start small with one networking event a year and check in calls twice a year and adjust based on participation and feedback from your member. Thanks, Jinky, for that presentation. Um, I just have a few more questions really to dig in about how your BAC really formed and how you're maintaining the BAC. So let's just start with, you know, how did the idea of forming a BAC came about? You know, like how big was your chapter at the time that you start thinking about a BAC? You know, uh, thanks for the question uh, to you. OCA Sacramento BAC was founded in 2007. The objectives are, of course, promote the diversity, increase the awareness of the API culture and the issue in the workplace. Establishing the strategic partnership to collaborate with the business owner and the community organization. And of course, to fund and obtain the sponsorship for the projects and the program. Establishing the BAC is the multi-year long process during which you are continuously establishing new relationship and cultivating existing partnership. It does not happen overnight. It is important to get to know your member personally and professionally. Um, yeah, I mean, so like, w was there a certain point in time in when your chapter, like, did you wait um, a few years after the chapter started? Like, I don't know how long you had been involved with Sacramento chapter or um, like was BAC something the chapter immediately had thought about? Um, like at what point did the chapter start thinking about having a BAC? You know, I did not start it. Uh, I started the uh, Sacramento in 2010. So it really, I know that Linda Ng started the uh, form in 2007. So they, they, they struggle a lot in 2007. So I was talking to Linda about it. And she said, they did not, I was like, they struggle a lot, at least three or four different board of directors to figure out, we need to do something about it. So when I joined, I said, Jinky, you're in charge. So uh, I'm the one sort of uh, 
go with it and go with the flow and do the way I want it and start it with the way the national started it and do the way I want to do it. I see, I see. So when you started, um, I mean, I know you yourself, Jinky, with your other role besides being Sacramento president, you work for Crossing CV, um, and Crossing CV is a funder of OCA National. You sit on our BAC. Um, so when you were creating Sacramento BAC, did you already have a couple of people you knew um, to recruit? Like, how did you find your BAC members? Yeah, just exactly like national. We have partnership and, you know, different hats here. Wells Fargo, uh, State Farm, Comcast. We have the relationships already. So what we did is like, you know what? Let's figure out what we can do uh, the same model as national, but do it in a local level and figure out what the Sacramento needs, the diversity that Sacramento have and figure out what we need and go from that. Okay, uh, the youth, uh, let's figure out what the community needs and, and get some funding from Comcast from Wells Fargo, from AARP, and then go from that and meet them personally and get to know them. So how have you maintained um, BAC membership? Like, do you um, have, like, you know, OCA National does quarterly BAC meetings. Do you also do, like, regular meetings with your BAC? Um, yeah, how do you, like, court them, maintain the relationship? You know, uh, we maintain, I mean, you know, right now, maintaining, uh, I mean, it really depends. Before, we always said, get to know them. We meet with them for networking, right? We have a successful two twice a year event for the Dragon Boat Festival at the same time for a reception in the Capitol. That's our two big events that we, we met. At the same time, we schedule one-on-one uh, -on -one with, with our each members. We get to know them and uh, figure out what is their goal? What do they want to do on each, uh, uh, their priorities? And what do they want to do to reach out to, to the AAPI community? Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, and so, you know, when you recruit these BAC members, I'm sure they come in, you know, they probably start off at like lower levels of contribution, maybe because they've never worked with OCA Sacramento before, or they're new to working with advocacy organizations. So then how do you like grow, um, grow them as a BAC member and grow their contribution level, grow their participation with you? Like, how do you, um, you know, uh, cultivate that. You know, reputation is the key, right? We have a great reputation with our BAC members. Our projects and programs have covered a wide range of a uh, team that's important to the Sacramento diverse community. They get to know us. Uh, they uh, what they know what we can do for the community. So they often approach us what they're looking for for the new projects or advocacy effort to fund like projects that we mentioned earlier, like distribution of the Asian hate for the community. So they usually ask for a feedback or um, an event before the event or after the events, just like today. We had our advocacy for the team. So what I did today is I sent a screen print for um, for the report. So I emailed our funder this morning. I said, here, this is what how many people just attend the, the youth program. And I let them know how many people. So it's just con communication is the key so that they know what is going on with their money. And also the, for the funding, BAC, oh, no, no, BAC uh, are aware that BAC members' budget or charitable giving may change year after year, 
right? So, uh, and you they plan their budget in advance, a year in advance. So you have to make sure that you are aware of their fiscal year budget. So, uh, or example, so uh, it depends upon the circumstances. We had the COVID-19 or search for anti-Asian hate. So you have to work on their, their planning. Uh, last year we have, or this year we have the anti-Asian hate. They want to say, they want to reach out to us. Hey, we have this budget uh, for the anti-Asian hate effort. Can you help us out? So you have to work upon their needs. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so you have to keep track of, you know, their fiscal calendar. Um, have you ever just, do, do they typically reach out to you? Or you, you just mentioned that they reach out to you and they say, oh, I have like a bigger budget this year or I have anti-hate budget. Do you ever just um, pitch to your BAC? Like, hey, I have this project. Like, are you willing to fund it? Like, how do how easy are those conversations for you and, and how do you usually navigate that? Yeah, first, uh, relationship is the key, right? So when I ask them, we have this idea, uh, can you help us out? And would you be able to fund us? If you get to know your BAC, if their goal is to reach out to, to the youth or to a world's leadership, and you think this is the, the target audience, you will ask them if they will fund this project. And it will be easier if they think, okay, and if they trust you um, enough, they will fund you for that budget. And if they ask you, it's like, okay, can you give me $5,000 or $10,000 for this two project? Usually we're blessed enough to have this relationship and they'll be able to give us that funding. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, um, I mean, Jingi, I know Sacramento, you have a big board, but you have zero staff. You have pay, no paid staff who are even part-time or full-time, whereas, you know, at National Center, um, I get paid to manage this relationship to, uh, to, to our BAC at OCA National. So how do you manage these, all of these relationships you're talking about, you know, having close relationships, meeting regularly? How do you do that without a staff person? What do you do? Our board of directors donates countless hours of service every year. Most of our board, do, uh, board of directors juggle full-time jobs, careers, and families to ensure success of our programs and take care of our BAC partners. We have a hard-working board of directors. There's no I in team. And it also helps to know each board of directors' strength. Overall, what helps the most is share passion to help the community. So how much grown our uh, grown the years is to, I'm sorry. can we change that? Can we do that? Sorry. Yeah, just go, just sorry. start again. Just start again. Okay. Okay, sorry, that messed me up on that one. Okay, our board of directors donate countless of hours of service every year. Most board of directors also juggle full-time career and family. To ensure success of our programs, they take care of our BAC partners. We have a hard working board of directors. There's no I in team. It also helps to know each board of directors strength. Overall, what helps the most is to share passion to help the community. With how much we've grown over the year, our goal is to hire a part-time executive director in 2022 for our chapter to continue to grow. If you're facing difficulty managing BAC without staff, here are a few ideas. Can you recruit more board of directors or volunteer, especially dedicated growing your BAC. Can you fund a staff person with alternative, alternate funding or intern to help you a paid fellowship program? 
Can you scale BAC activities to something manageable or being more strategic or prioritization? That's, a, that's some pretty solid starting advice, I think, for our chapters um, and, and our JCL friends uh, as well. Um, yeah, I think, do you, so um, how big or how small can a BAC be? You know, do you think you have, you know, is, is there a sweet spot number that you're looking for at all times or, you know, the bigger, the better? You know, you have to start small. You have to have a, I always say, you don't want to get bigger and better, right? I mean, last year or this year with the COVID, it's tough. We don't know what's going to happen because we did not have a big fundraising. So we don't know. It's like, okay, what's going to happen? So we always suggest to get small, get one BAC partners that do you think is going to help you and then grow bigger. We always said, it's like, okay, let's try someone or some, you know, maybe a government or county to help you to fund a project or program and then continue to grow because you don't want to get bigger and fail. You don't want to do that with your board of directors or with the community partners. Yeah, that's, that's very true. Um, I think that's, you know, all the questions that I had, um, you know, even, even for me is, is some good advice to remember for when I work with our BAC. Um, and so after this, we'll turn it over to um, our live broadcast where you and um, Peggy will bring her back on screen um, to see if our audience has any questions. Uh, feel free to drop your questions in the chat box below. Peggy and Jinky, as well as myself and the staff, are here to um, answer any questions. But we'll also answer some questions live. So, um, yeah, we'll we'll see if there's any questions coming through right now. <laughs> 